It's the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Mike Francesa Podcast. As we uh, open today with a look at baseball, and yes, the season will be upon us, weather permitting, uh, tomorrow here in New York. It looks like there's a very good chance the Mets could uh, be unlucky on opening day and have to wait till Friday where it looks like it'll be sunny and in the 50s. So, But it will maybe be delayed one day, but opening day is upon us. Yankees will open on the road. Mets will open at home. And I'd say there is optimism for the Yankees that has been tempered somewhat by the injuries, especially the one to Cole. And for the Mets, I don't think anybody has any idea what to do with this season and I think they have to understand it is a very different season and not a not a unwise season by Stearns. I think it's a wise move for him to wait to spend the money. We know the money's there. Wait to spend the money for the right guys. They went after a couple of the big guys this year. They didn't get them. Uh, considering that uh, some of the stuff that's gone on there c- could prove fortuitous. Um, he needs a year to evaluate. He wants to use this year to analyze, to observe, to test, to try out. I think you will see him bring prospects up and give them a chance to play. I think you will see him move people through the roster Uh, And you could even have a trade or two of a veteran. And I know everyone's looking to see what happens with Alonzo. And everyone, a lot of baseball people have him moving to the Cubs in season. I think that would be a very unwise move. We'll see how this uh, progresses. But it makes it a very weird year, a very unusual year. They're not contenders. They're not, you know, a 65-win team, clearly, but they're not a 90-win team, clearly. They are a somewhere between high 70s to low 80s team. And uh, I know a lot of the people who do this and look at how many games a team will win felt that the Mets spread might be the widest of any team in the majors this year, that it could be that big a gap because of what's going to go on, who's going to be there, who's not going to be there, that kind of thing. Um, Let me start with the Yankees. I'll tell you what, let me give you the other teams first, and then we'll save the Yankees and Mets uh, for last. Uh, As far as over and unders for baseball, my first over is Tampa Bay over 84 and a half. This has become kind of automatic. It happens every year. Um, you know, if you listen to me, that I am a very, very big proponent of what they do and how smart their owner is. Uh, I talk about him at length. People have copied him. They've spread his people throughout baseball. Uh, they have become very much the teachers of this generation. And they do it with no revenues, as we know. And they do it amazingly well. Um, They lost some pitchers. They lost, obviously, a tremendous talent to a very weird situation. But the rest of their lineup is very good, and it's highly productive. And they are great at at mixing and matching. They do an incredible job. Their number's 84 and a half. I see them in the high 80s. I don't think they're in the high 90s or in the mid-90s. They're obviously not going to get off to the start they uh, did last year. But I still think they're very solid. I like them as an over at 84.5. My second over is Milwaukee at 77.5. I like – I think they're underrated in a lot of ways. Um, Still like the bullpen, and I think that uh, they're, they're going to have a winning season, and I like them over 77 and a half. If I like a team over under, I usually have to feel the numbers at least five away from the number because otherwise I would pass. I think Tampa's in, I have Tampa at 89, 
I have Milwaukee at 83. So they're at 77 and a half. I like them both. Now, two, so over Tampa Bay, 84 and a half. Over Milwaukee, 77 and a half. Two unders. Detroit under 81 and a half. I think it's way too ambitious. I think they're expecting way too much. Uh, they're putting the cart way before the horse. I think they do. They have improved players. They have some promising players. They've definitely, they're on the upswing. But I think 81 and a half is way too much. I do not see them as a winning team. And I have them as the under. And then I have a very bad team as an under. I think Washington at 66 and a half is an under. I think they'll be lucky to win 60 games. They, there's nothing there. And they are in a very, very competitive division. Uh, where you're going to have a 100-win team at the top, a good Philly team, a sneaky good Miami team, and the Mets. So uh, I think Washington's going to have a very, very tough season. So two unders and two overs, Tampa over 84.5, Milwaukee over 77.5, two unders, Detroit under 81.5, Washington under 66.5. That leaves the Yankees and the Mets. The Yankee number was... Sitting anywhere from 94, 93 and a half, 94 until Cole went down. We don't know how long he's gone. We don't know what the news is going to be. It could be in a month, hey, he's not coming back till after the also break. It could be he's gone for the season. It could be he's back June 1st. We just don't know. We just don't know. Um, the Yankee lineup is going to be enormously improved. I've talked about that at length. I don't have to spend a lot of time on it this morning. We know what Soto brings. We know what Verdugo brings, okay? Having left-handed bats and what that means, having balance in the order, having two of the three or four best players in all of baseball in the lineup back-to-back. Soto's going to have an enormous season. He's on a walk year. He's looking for a half a, mi- a, half a billion dollar contract. Um, Judge, we know how productive he's going to be. You just want to keep him healthy. I think you'll see him in center, which I don't think puts a strain on him. I do think Grisham will play more than you think. And let's be honest, you know guys get injured. You hope it's not Soto or Judge. But you know one of them's going to be, you know, pull a muscle or bang something or hurt something and be out a couple of weeks. That's just the way it goes. And the same thing for the other starters, you're going to have guys, you're going to have guys who need to play. You know you need a bench. You know you need extra players. You know guys get hurt. It happens all the time. You have to have some depth, so they have it with Grisham. When Grisham plays, I'd like to see him bat leadoff. Okay? I'd like to see him bat leadoff against righties, even if is in the lineup. is not in the lineup right now. Uh, I would start him if he's playing. I don't think he's going to play the first couple of days, but I think he's going to play more than you think. Okay? Uh, I think Otherwise, I'm sure they'll start. I would think they'll start the year with Volpe batting first. He's not a leadoff hitter. His on base percentage isn't good. His batting average isn't good. Uh, he does run. He will steal bases. He will hit for power. He had over 20 doubles last year, had over 20 homers last year, had over 20 steals last year. You can expect him to do all that again and improve his on base percentage and improve his, his batting average. His defense was solid. I don't think he was gold glove good. Um, the lineup is so much better than last year, which was the most anemic, unbalanced, unproductive, awful lot lineup that I can ever remember the Yankees putting in since the days of uh, Stump Merrill. I mean, it was that bad. It was just, you know, it, it was that bad. There was three and four and sometimes five automatic outs in the lineup. I mean, I didn't know what they were doing. They, they didn't know what they were doing. They clearly showed that. Now they go out and they add some highly productive bats. I think Verdugo is going to do very well. I think he's going to have over 50 extra base hits. I think he's going to do very well at Yankee Stadium. I think that uh, Grisham, when he plays, will do well, and it will hit a surprising number of homers. I think that Soto is going to have a huge year. I think he's going to love Yankee Stadium. I think he's going to love playing in New York. And I think he's on a year where he's going to be very motivated. And he's a motivated hitter anyway. And he's a highly selective hitter. Power and patience. He walks a lot. 
His on base percentage is usually well over four. And he slugs. He's going to be his OPS will be right around a thousand. You probably have two guys back to back whose OPS will be right around a thousand, which is tremendous. Um, bottom line, their lineup's going to be so much better. They're going to score so many more runs than they did last year. The long ball is going to be back to the old days where it's at the top of the league. But you have to be concerned about the pitching. You ha- first of all, they're in a very good division. Secondly, you have to be concerned about the pitching. With Cole on the shelf, with question marks in that rotation, you wonder about certain guys. Are you going to get enough out of them? Are you going to get any, any real productivity out of certain guys? Can you count on young guys to fill the voids that have to be filled? I mean, these are questions that they have to answer. All right? I like what says. Will he be healthy? All right? I think Schmidt's going to be okay. I really do. I think he's going to be okay. I'm not worried about him. Rodon I don't like at all. Stroman, I think, is a pro. I don't think he's made for Yankee Stadium. I think he'll pitch better on the road, but he's a pro. To go out there and give you six solid innings a lot of times, especially on the road. I worry about him a little bit at Yankee Stadium because he's got the type of stuff that you can turn into a lot of fly balls to right field. Uh, I worry about that. I don't think the bullpen is uh, deep enough. I'm a little worried about it. The Yankees have a habit of producing arms. There's no question they're very good at that. And... I still believe that they will, despite the fact they didn't do it in preseason and they didn't do it after the Cole injury, I still think they will not let the year fall apart and not let them not make a serious run at the playoffs by making the move that they have to make, whether it's taking on contract or even dipping into a couple of prospects who they really don't want to give up. Um, the number at 91 and a half is not imposing if everything is good, but everything isn't perfect, especially in the pitching. And in spots, the roster's fragile, especially when it comes to injury. You worry now a lot about injuries to LeMayu, Rizzo, Stanton, Judge, that's a lot. Not having the ability to back all those guys up, it's an issue. It's been an issue, it will be an issue. They are in a tough division, a very tough division. They have to play tough teams out of the box, which I don't like it because there's a chance they could get off to a slow start, and a slow start has a habit of really lingering into the middle of the warm weather before it gets fixed. They open with a very tough schedule. Four in Houston, three in Arizona, then Toronto, Miami. Cleveland's not great, but then Toronto and Tampa. 19 of the first 22, either against a very good club or a club that had a winning record last year. That is an imposing schedule to play early when you're a little worried about your pitching and worried about getting things very settled. Opening up Houston, Arizona, then Toronto, then Miami, at Cleveland, at Toronto, and then Tampa. Not easy at all, and it could lead to a shaky start, which I don't like. I like teams to get out of the gate, get a cushion underneath them, and have the ability to play confident ball because they're coasting a little bit. This schedule worries me from that standpoint. You add all that up. You take into account Baltimore. You take into account Tampa. You take into account Toronto. The Red Sox don't look very good, but they're still the Red Sox. I don't see this team. 
I do see them making the playoffs. I don't see them winning 90 games. I think they're going to win high 80s. I think 90 would be the high watermark. If Cole were healthy, I probably would have thought they could win 93, 94, and I would have nudged it probably to the over. With him, a big question mark, knowing how much he means to the rotation and to the credibility of the rotation, it drops me down to where I can see them in the 87, 88 area, which will get them in the playoffs. Um, I think they're an under at 91 and a half. I think they're borderline either way, but I think they're an, or they're stronger to me with the Collinger. They're stronger to the underside than they are to the overside, and I'm and I am accommodating the offense, which is going to be very good and highly productive. They don't have a leadoff hitter. We know that, but other than that. I like a lot of things about the lineup, including the balance and the infusion of lefties with Soto, with Verdugo, okay? Even Grisham, I think, is going to make a big difference. A healthy Rizzo who did nothing after Memorial Day last year. Absolutely nothing. If he comes back in at 25, forget 35, but he comes back with a 25 homer a year inserted into this lineup, that's going to make a big difference. Because you have, in Judge and Soto, you have two of the three best players in baseball back-to-back. But I still think it's a smidge to the under. I think it's an under. Not at the Mets. All right? You need a little bit of a crystal ball with the Mets because a lot of things could twist certain ways. Uh, Some youngsters could come up and have a big year. Things could really click out of that bullpen and the starting rotation turns out to be a little better than you thought. And all of a sudden, the Mets get off to a pretty decent start. And now they start to believe a little bit and they say, wait a second, we can get to the postseason this year. And they throw a little cash at that. That's the very optimistic side. Senga comes back early. He's not gone as long as you think. Remember, he wasn't durable last year. He pitched brilliantly at at times and well overall, but he only threw 166 innings. You'd sign for that right now in a second. You're not going to get 166 innings this year. Now, you look at it realistically. It's a tough division. You got a 100-win team. And other than the Dodgers, without question, a 100-win team and a legitimate World Series favorite in the Braves, they're going to win 100 games. Having that in the division impacts your record. It does. Philly's going to win, you know, somewhere around 88 to 90 games. I don't think Miami wins as many as they did last year, but they're still dangerous. And listen, Senga out. Quintana, Severino, who pitched well in the spring. McGill, Manaya, Hauser. You know what? You can't have a lot of faith in that rotation. If everything hit, and that means two of those guys somehow pitch well enough to be 14, 15 game winners. Backed up by a a terrific closer and a surprising bullpen. That's the best you could ever hope for with that rotation. The downside of that rotation is Severino reverts to last year. He was miserable. Quintana's won nine games in his last four years. You know I could go down the line and and cast a terrible picture of all of these starting pitchers. That's scary. Does not have anything? Single second half of the season, fine. That's reasonable. But I think there's a lot of unknown here. 
But I think the more logical thing is that this is a year of testing, analyzing, observing, looking, moving, matching, and they wind up on the south side of uh, break even. I think it's the only way to play him at 88 and a half is under. I don't think you can play him over with that rotation. I just don't think you can. And the fact that you got a 100-win team in the division. And I don't love first nine games, they can do some damage if they play well. Then they have four games on the road with the Braves and then a trip to the West Coast to play the Dodgers and the Giants in April. They are going to be in Atlanta for four, in L.A. for three, and in San Francisco for three in April. Those are ten hellacious road games in April for a rotation trying to find itself, pitching staff trying to find itself, lineup in some places trying to find itself. New manager, everything else. The fact is, if they don't get off well on those first nine, if they go four and five or less, and then you're looking at the Braves, the Dodgers, and the Giants on the road in April, they could dig themselves a hole early. And that scares me because that just sets a, now everyone's looking at the manager sideways. Everyone's wondering what the first move is. What's the first shoe to drop? Who's the first guy to get moved? Who's the first? So this team is going to have a lot of that skepticism right at its doorstep because of the way it's built this year. And that can lead to a lot of negativity, especially if Alonzo thinks he's out of here and he acts that way doesn't get off to a fair start, thinks he's out of here, and brings that to the clubhouse every day. For a new manager trying to find his way, that could be a very tough chore. Now, that's the negative scenario. I gave you first the positive scenario. You know, they... I don't think... I know some people, I've seen people, you know, be harsh on their, uh, on their lineup. I don't think their lineup, I don't think it's terrible. Now, we all don't know what Marte is going to give anybody. A good Marte, bad Marte, but you do know this. Lonzo's going to hit home runs. Lindor's going to hit and hit for power and play every day and do what he does at shortstop. And what he does is produce a hell of a lot of runs. The catch is going to hit. I mean, even on a sophomore jinx, he's going to hit 20 homers. He might hit 30 homers. I think you add all that up and... You know, with Nimmo and with everybody, with Bader, um, obviously bringing in a very, very experienced, good bat to add to the lineup was a distinct positive. Um, their, Their lineup is not terrible. It's not, you know, overpowering. It's not going to keep you up nights, but it's not a bad lineup. They have the closer. We know that. And you're worried. You look at the starting pitching and you say, I got my fingers crossed. And I'll hope for the best because when you don't have one guy in a rotation that you can hang your hat on who you know has just superior stuff, it's hard enough when you have a couple of those guys. When you have none of those guys, it it, it can be a very scary proposition. 
It really can. And I, I think you'd have to, from that standpoint, being fair and realizing guys could leave and realizing that, you know, things can, can change in a lot of different ways on this team. Uh, I can't put them over 80 and a half. I got to put them under. So I know I'm being a little less than gleeful about the New York year. But I think if the Mets won 85 games with this team, that would be sensational. That would be a sensational season. And I don't think they have that in them. Uh, I don't think they're going to be dreadful. I don't think they're going to be unwatchable. I don't think they're not going to be able to have some success at times. But, you know, it's a long year. And there's a lot of twists and turns. And there is a 100-win team in their division. And a couple of teams that are significantly better than them in their division. And the unsettled nature of the Alonzo thing is not a positive if you're looking for the situation to be distinctly positive all year. If you're asking me how many games I think the Mets win, I think they win somewhere between 75 and 78, somewhere around there. And I think that they make a lot of decisions that have to be made and they have a very good plan about what they want to do going forward. And listen, I expect them. I expect them to be major players for Soto. Major. They're going to watch them all year. They're going to be thrilled by what they see. And I expect them to be very big players for him. I'd be surprised if they weren't. Does that start a feud, maybe? But you know what? They laid off the one they had to lay off, which was Judge. They don't have to lay off Soto. So just to review, I see the Yankees in the high 80s, but not reaching the 92 they need to go over. So I have the Yankees under 91 and a half. I have the Mets under 80 and a half. I have Tampa Bay over 84 and a half. Milwaukee over 77 and a half, Detroit under 81 and a half, and Washington under 66 and a half. My next team that I would have taken if I had to take one more would have been, and I almost took them, Kansas City over. I have a, I was on that for a while, and I just had a couple things that bothered me, and I backed off. They were my next play. So we'll see if I should have taken that one or not. Uh, But I was going to take them as an over, and I didn't. So I backed off. I find that when you go with those teams like that, as overs, you're wrong more than right. You know, unless they make a quantum leap and they just jump way up, those teams usually find their watermark on the low side. So baseball's back tomorrow. Like I said, very good chance, if you're looking at the weather forecast, that's a mess. Probably call that off early. Why deal with it? Why, why deal with it and bring everybody out and sit through rain delays and everything else when you know Friday you have the open date and you know already it's going to be sunny and 55 to 60 uh, degrees. So you know that day's there. You have that day on the calendar for sure just for this. Announce it early, and then you don't have to worry about it. So I wouldn't be surprised if they announced it sometime uh, early tomorrow morning or uh, even late tonight that they're not going to play tomorrow because the weather forecast tomorrow is for a, a complete washout, pretty much. It's 95% chance of rain tomorrow. So, uh, um, And watching the weather this morning, it looked like there was no way they were going to get a chance. Looks like it's going to be breezy and a high of somewhere around 56, but uh, sunshine on sun, on Friday. So if that's the case, they can at least play the game on Friday. Yankees will be in uh, Houston, opening up 
tough place to open, but hey, you got to start somewhere. So uh, they will be there, and you know the excitement for them as far as home will be a week away. They will open against Toronto at home uh, down the road. They first have seven games against Houston and Arizona on the road before they uh, come back to play Toronto uh, and Miami. So um, we're finally here. Now, it's early. I, I, I've never liked baseball opening. I know why they do it. I know what they're trying to accomplish. But I never liked them opening this early because let's be, let's be honest. I mean, here's a perfect example. In the Northeast, it's just not ready for you. I mean, here, there's not one day in the next week on the advanced schedule here, on the advanced weather forecast here, where it's going to be 60 degrees. Baseball is to be played north of 60 degrees. I mean, you don't like baseball in the 40s. You don't like baseball in the, you know, lower 50s. It's just, it's not warm enough. Uh, you want some warmer weather if you can get it. Now, I understand it's early in the season, and, you know, we've everyone's lived through it at other times, but it's just not conducive to the sport. It really isn't. The sport's just so much better when the weather's nice. That's all there is to it. I mean, it's a sport to be played in nice weather and hot weather. That's just what the game is. It's, you know, it makes the game better, crisper, you know, more explosive, everything. You know, not when guys are all bundled up, you know, trying to get through the wind and the rain and, you know, maybe even some snow floors, which we've seen at times through the years. But when you start in March in the Northeast or in the Midwest, you're going to face what you face. That's just the way it is. So we have the NCAA tournament back in action tomorrow. We've talked about that already. We did a podcast on it already and got you up to date on that. We'll update it again once they play Thursday night, four games tomorrow. Uh, followed by four games on uh, Friday. Very, very, you know, good matchups because you have obviously plenty, plenty of named teams. Tomorrow, Clemson and Arizona, San Diego State and Connecticut, Alabama and North Carolina, Illinois and Iowa State, which is a really wonderful, competitive, terrific you know, regional semifinal. That's that's a regional semifinal, Illinois and, and Iowa State. I mean, those are two very, very good teams. Same thing for Gonzaga, which is playing very well against Purdue. Gonzaga could beat Purdue. Duke could beat Houston. The Duke you saw against James Madison could beat Houston. Houston's got some issues right now. They're not at 100%. They're having some depth issues. They have some injury issues. Um... That's a dangerous game. You want to see if Duke, which upped its toughness level against James Madison. James Madison pushed Wisconsin all over the arena. They, they talked the talk against Duke, and then Duke punished them. Inside, outside, upside, you name it. They did it sideways. They, did every, they just buried them. That was as well as Duke has played all year. I mean, probably by far the best game they've played all year. Uh, they will have to bring that against Houston. Then Creighton and Tennessee, another terrific game. Very different styles of play. Creighton wanting to move the ball, wanting to shoot the ball uh, uh, from the three-point line, looking for a way to get threes. Tennessee, defense, 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 pound the glass. Pound the defensive glass, pound the offensive glass. Go get the ball off the offensive glass and score. That's a big part of their game. Major Major matchup there, too. Uh, so some very interesting matchups. Alabama and uh, Carolina, if you want to see teams run and run and run, get ready for that because they will play first one to 95, and neither one's backing down in that game. So if you want run and gun, you're going to get it there. They're going to go up and down, up and down the court. That's all there is to it. I mean, Alabama does it. Carolina does it. And Alabama has no intention of stopping against anybody. They, there's no three they won't take. You know, Sears' range is ridiculous. I mean, he will shoot it from anywhere, and he makes it from anywhere. He is an amazing scorer. He really is. If you haven't seen him, check him out because he can score with anybody. So can Shannon on Illinois. So some interesting players uh, to watch as we move forward in that. So a very busy time. Enjoy. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks for listening to the Mike Francesa podcast on the Bet Rivers Network.